Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the committee to, for inviting me, and uh, thank you all for coming and listening. So I'm going to be very controversial. Um, I didn't like the title, so I changed it. And so this is um, 10 reasons not to do focal therapy. And these are the 10 reasons that we really go through, we went through in our mind five, six years ago when I started with Mark, and we started this programmed, phased evaluation of focal therapy. So reason one, you all say it when I talk about focal therapy is prostate cancer is multifocal. Well, so are many other cancers. And the question really is, is this the lesion that we can identify and ablate and can we identify it uh, accurately? Renal cancer, bladder cancer, thyroid, breast is all multifocal. We've just seen a Lancet Oncology in breast cancer where they do a targeted radiation boost after wide local excision and not external beam radiotherapy to the whole breast and it has same uh, recurrence rates as external beams. So this is the same paradigm, we're all surgical oncologists, this is about margins. So this is a study we did with uh, the imperial surgeons, we looked at their radical prostatectomies, uh, most of them were done by uh, the late Tim Christmas, uh, some of them by uh, Matt Winkler. and. Most of the extracapsular extension, most of the Gleason score 7s or greater, resided in the index lesion and not in the secondary lesions. These are our UCH series and again confirmed that most of the Gleason 7s resided in high volume lesions greater than 0.2 or 0.5 cc in volume. You've seen this study before. Uh, by Laurie, uh, uh, mentioned by Laurie Klotz. This is a multi-center analysis of uh, almost 10,000 men who had surgery um, uh, with pure Gleason 6 on their radical prostatectomy specimens and actually through it, no man after radical prostatectomy died when they had pure Gleason 6. Now surgery is good, but it's not that good. Everybody quotes this paper this paper uh, showed that sometimes you have a tiny lesion which matches up with the lymph node mets. These are rare. These are not men that we would recruit for focal therapy. These guys need multimodal treatment. But even so, what this study did show is that usually when they did have mets, only one area of the prostate metastasized or one lesion metastasized. When you ask Boss, David Bostwick whether this lesion could actually be part of this lesion and this lesion here, then he will say yes, because you can easily get skip lesions when you do whole mounts every, uh, every slice, uh, three, four millimeters. You can miss intervening tumor. This study showed that when you do have lymph node mets and look at the temporis erg gene fusion signature of those lymph node mets and the individual lesions, Secondary lesions did metastasize, but all of those secondary lesions had higher grade disease, higher volume disease. This study showed that all the METs to a lymph node matched the index lesion and not any single uh, secondary lesion. And this study, my favorite, showed that when you did get metastases in men, uh, these were men treated in John Hopkins, those metastases all came from one single precursor cell. What they were not able to do was go back to the prostates and see whether they matched any individual lesion. Laurie has gone through one of the studies where they have looked at one of those men now, um, but that again is a very rare occurrence, a tiny bit of Gleason 6 in a sea of Gleason 7, 8, and 9 does not really uh, prove the exception. So prostate cancer is multifocal in the majority, if not all men. We need to agree, as a profession, that treating everything is not a legitimate nor sustainable option. Otherwise, a third of the men in this room would have to go off and get their prostates removed. We need to decide as a profession what we need to treat, and as a result, we need to decide what we don't need to find. So reason two, you cannot accurately localize prostate lesions. I think we can, I think we have a tool at the moment, which allows us to risk stratify accurately to within 95% accuracy and to localize individual lesions. This is a computer simulation study from our group showing that trust biopsy performs pretty awfully in men actually who've already had their prostate out because 
the trust biopsy found cancer, and template biopsy obviously performs the best. No matter how good you try to make that trust biopsy, it can never get to that top left-hand corner. Template, when you compare it against whole mount radical prostatectomy, this is David Crawford's group in a small number of men, about 30 or 40, they missed one lesion, one clinically significant lesion, which was tiny, even a truss biopsy, possibly even a radical prostatectomy in other men would miss. Somehow the RP whole mount slices got it, and it was Gleason 8. But the problem is template biopsies identify lots of cancer, leads to significant overdiagnosis if we're not careful, has additional burdens on patients and healthcare systems. So what are, the, are there any criteria that we can use to uh, determine whether individual lesions are clinically significant? And this is, I won't go into the details of this, but this uh, effectively when you do a template biopsy, you're sampling every five millimeters, you're getting a truer hit of every single lesion, and therefore you're better able to predict whether a lesion is 0 0.2 or 0.5 cc. And if you use these criteria, you will find, you will accurately determine the presence of 95% of 0.2 cc lesions or 95% of 0.5 cc lesions if you use a higher uh, cancer core length based on a true hit. And these are the sort of reports that our uh, long-suffering pathologist Alex Freeman gives us. Um, and as you can see, we found a lesion there, but this man had focal therapy of the red and yellow lesion. And when you do template biopsies, we've just had this accepted, um, uh, almost 300 men who've undergone template biopsies. If you look at these criteria and see which men are suitable after a template biopsy for focal therapy, then whether they have intermediate or low risk disease at baseline, about 95% of the men in our series, if you accept index lesion ablation, were suitable for a focal therapy strategy. And we're now looking at targeted therapies based on MRI, targeted biopsies based on MRI. This is the Lille group, again, showing against radical prostatectomy that the negative predictive value for high volume lesions, which harbor the poor prognostic pathological variables, is extremely high. When we compared our MRIs to uh, template mapping biopsies, three reporters independently blinded to the template biopsies um, in men who've already had a truss biopsy. This is an old series now, just accepted. 1.5 Tesla multiparametric MRI, template mapping biopsies, no targeted biopsies in this series. When you ask it to rule out any cancer, it can't. When you ask MRI to rule out 0.2 cc or non-dominant Gleason 7 or greater, then the negative predictive value starts to creep up to 90%, some variability with readers. And then when you ask it to rule out a 0.5 cc, which is purely Gleason 6, or any element of dominant pattern 4, then you're getting negative predictive values of about 95%. The picture trial is validating this prospectively. Abby in the audience is our research fellow who's currently running it. Lucy Simmons has just left us and she's in Bristol, but she started this and we've recruited um, about 260 men. The last 20 uh, are yet to go. So this will demonstrate whether those results are reproducible in a prospective manner. The PROMISE trial you all know about, large multicenter, some of you will be involved or are attempting to be involved. We've recruited 150 of the 700. Charter is in the audience, he's our research fellow who's running this. And this is quite an extraordinary trial, which I am hoping that we will finish and recruit uh, quickly before practice changes. Reason three, focal therapy treats men who don't need treatment. So in our index trial, we treat um, mainly intermediate and high-risk disease as determined by us. Very few of these get treated. When I do the substantial amendment next week for index, we will not allow any man with, Gleas with green disease to be treated in the index trial. Systematic review uh, shows uh, by Massimo, who's in the audience, he's our research fellow who did that, just been published, um, a number of series, and as you can see, 
quite a few now treat Gleason 7, not Gleason 6 disease. For men who need treatment, radical therapy is effective, so men and their physicians just have to put up with the side effects. When you do a discrete choice experiment and ask men how they would choose between different treatments and the attributes of those different treatments, men want good quality of life. So if you give them severe urinary leakage, they want two years of life in return beyond a 12-year life expectancy. If you give them severe impotence or severe loss of libido, they want up to half a year of life in return. So men value quality of life, in many cases above life expectancy. Focal therapy has no better functional outcomes than modern robotic radical surgery. These are, this is a large study which showed that the functional outcomes after radical therapies is quite significant. Some of this decrease is age-related, but as you can see, the immediate drop in quality of life from, uh, sorry, in, in sexual function and in urinary function is quite significant. So there's much more to do. In an expert center, because none of us get complications after our own surgeries, in an expert Memorial Sloan Kettering series, these are the sort of outcomes they used to get. Now, these are all fairly high volume guys, and they're still getting um, similar rates to what you just saw in that 3,000 patient study from uh, David Penson. So how does focal therapy uh, uh, achieve, achieve fo functional outcomes? So this is the systematic review again, and again, very high rates of urinary preservation and sexual preservation, although a proportion do still need phosphodiesterase inhibitors. The rectal fistula rate is very, very low. Focal therapy should have no side effects. This was a commentary by Declan Murphy and Ben Shalikum in European Urology, and I, I think any treatment that you subject to the prostate is going to cause side effects, and I think we shouldn't let perfection get in the way of very good. So I won't go into that in any more detail. <laughs> HIFU has poor outcomes. So can the robot and HIFU live together? This is the Royal Marsden robot, Chris Ogden's. Uh, while he wasn't looking, I took a photo. Um, I don't know whether it's hugging or attacking, but um, I think we can uh, live together. These are our own uh, HIFU uh, numbers, so we do increasingly lots of focal, very few whole gland. The first trial we showed uh, was in J-Ural, hemiablation, very carefully selected group of men with good functional outcomes. This is a man with left-sided uh, disease on MRI, we ablated his entire left-hand side. At six months, there's a small nubbin of tissue, which you, if you oversample with truss biopsy in this case, in his case, he had no significant cancer. He had no cancer at all. The PSA drops about 80% at about three to six months and stays there. If there's, if there's a rise, there's something going on, we do an MRI. In this series, we biopsied almost everybody. One man refused and uh, two of those were positive. And then overall, small series, this is a small group of men, well characterized with excellent baseline function. There was about a 90% trifecta. Uh, in the reported literature, the trifecta rate uh, for surgery varies between 30 and 60%. This is the uh, N equals 41 study. Again, very carefully characterized group of men. We ablated whatever we could see on MRI or template biopsy, and we biopsied the areas afterwards. Again, similar drop in PSA, less of a, a, a drop at the beginning because of the smaller amounts of tissue we're ablating. And then this graph really summarizes, as you start to decrease your surgical margin, as we do uh, in other cancers, we start to see residual disease in the area. I don't think this is any different to a positive surgical margin after prostatectomy. This is about surgical margins. Can be retreated, and most of these men were retreated. Erectile preservation, 90, about 85 to 90%. No man was leaking by six to nine months, no pad use. Cryotherapy does a really good job as well. So this isn't about HIFU. This is about the concept of focal therapy. And the this is the treated side. And as you can see, very few had positive biopsies of the treated side. They used truss biopsy to characterize their disease at baseline. 
and the untreated side, as you can see, starts to show more disease. Surprise, surprise, it matches the 30-40% misclassification rate of trust biopsy. Reason eight, treating less than the whole prostate leaves risks leaving cancer behind. So you're risking men's lives. This is a comment, uh, this is one comment uh, from a few years back. The procedure is cancer sparing surgery. It was actually made to um, Patrick Walsh when he brought out nerve sparing radical prostatectomy. I don't think he'd be very happy if I said I was taking the baton of his innovation further. Um, this is the response to nerve sparing prostatectomy, total prostatectomy remains the optimal treatment for patients with clinically localized carcinoma of the prostate. So there was huge resistance to nerve spurring radical prostatectomy when it first came out. There was huge resistance, I think, to partial nephrectomy. The major disadvantage of nephron sparing surgery for renal carcinoma is the risk of local recurrence. And go back to our, ran of our systematic review what are the outcomes? So when men do have a biopsy, overall, they have a residual cancer rate, which varies. Most of these are at about the 10 to 20% rate, and the rate of clinically significant disease is, is low, i.e. absence of Gleason pattern 4, less than 4 millimeters of Gleason 3 plus 3. The need for whole gland treatment varies between different series, and I think it depends on um, how you individually characterize that baseline. Um, I've just got our data from Stephanie, who's in the audience. Um, we've done over 500 focal therapies over the last five years, and of those, 3% proceeded to whole gland radical therapy. About 17% had redo. Reason nine, there are no ran data from randomized controlled trials. Problem is, comparative surgical research has a problem. We all think we know best, and patients, usually in prostate cancer setting, want a choice. For example, if you look at nephron sparing surgery, EAU level, one, uh, level 2B evidence has led to a change in recommendation for nephron sparing surgery. The prospective randomized control trial that's ongoing in terms of follow-up, the oncological results are eagerly awaited to confirm to confirm that nephron sparing surgery is an acceptable approach for small asymptomatic RCC. Uh, I wonder what would happen if it didn't confirm it. Can we deliver a randomized controlled trial to evaluate novel interventions in prostate cancer? I think this is the sort of study that most of us do, preference-based studies the patient or the physician chooses. It's not ideal, there's residual confounders. This is going to be difficult, a head-to-head -head randomized control trial of focal therapy versus whole gland treatment. These are the successes. I think overall, protect cost about 25 million, so we're not going to repeat that. What people don't talk about is the failures, and we've had about 11 failed randomized control trials over the last 10 years in the localized disease space. Half of those were here. A better way of randomizing may be looking at changing the way we randomize. So this is a design that we've been thinking about. You ask men whether they'd want to go into a cohort. Before they go into the cohort, you ask them whether they would be happy to be approached at some time in the future randomly for future interventions. And then you follow them up with electronic health records. Whether the funders will go for this is a different matter. They've already rejected it once. Reason 10, the last one. No one outside of UCL is doing this. I beg to differ. So to conclude, I think we have to be careful. This is the only probable political slide I'm going to put up. If the past quarter century has brought minimally invasive procedures, the next may bring the elimination of invasion. In cardiothoracic surgery, an excess of 80 surgeons were trained and many post-CCT trainees were being advised about 10 years ago to retrain as general practitioners. This was the, these were blogs done at the time and the comments were made by a trainee who was considering cardiothoracic surgery. I am led to believe that this is no longer 
a viable career option, mostly thanks to the cardiologists doing all the minimally invasive stuff. Is it a dying specialty, cardiothoracic surgery? Will it be a thing of the past in the not too distant future? And this is the response from somebody who is a, a non-cardiothoracic surgeon already in training. Cardiothoracic surgeons in the UK have contributed to their own specialty's downfall by not embracing new technology, interventional cardiology techniques. Current trainees in vascular surgery appear to have learned from your mistakes and started to demand interventional radiological training in angiography, plasty, EVARs, and stenting. So the future, I think, is going to be image-guided. We're going to improve our risk stratification. During our procedure, we're going to acquire a 3D ultrasound map. Claire or one of her colleagues will give us a detailed MRI, and we will have a target to hit. We will register that image or model from the MRI, and then be able to target just that lesion. I think if we relabel low-risk cancer uh, benign, then it doesn't matter because we, it will just go away. We're not going to find it because we're going to find the high-risk disease and active surveillance will be a thing of the past, Laurie. Thank you very much. So the, uh, why ultrasound, not brachytherapy? I mean, brachytherapy would seem to be um, a more likely candidate of energy that we're used to delivering for focal therapy. What are your thoughts about? Sure. So, so I think there's loads. There's RF ablation, there's electroporation, there's brachytherapy, there's cryo, there's HIFU, uh, the photodynamic therapy, photothermal therapy. We've just got a grant to look at magnetic nanoparticles to ablate. So I think there, there are lots of ablative techniques. I think once you localize the lesion, uh, you, you can target it in whichever way you want. And I think brachytherapy is a very legitimate and very good treatment. And I know guys and um, uh, Stephen started his own trial, but guys are certainly keen. And we're very happy to you know, look into that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.